I see that you are full of bitterness. <laughs> did, did I hear? Uh... <laughs> Did I hear the Apostle Peter there? <laughs> so I wanted to read, I've taken to, uh, are you familiar with this, this app called, called Dwell? No, I haven't heard of that. So it's, a, it's an audio Bible, but, hey Antonio, but it's a lot more than that. It is, um, you can set up reading plans and uh you can like they have things broken down by um, like certain kinds of scriptures. Like there's days and days full of uh, biblical characters that they just read passages about biblical characters. Oh. So you can pick these different reading plans. And um, so uh, so I, it's my backup method. But I'm going through the Bible right now, and uh, so you can download different. They have. A choice of voices, and you can put music in the background. Oh wow! Can you send me the link to this? Yes. Yeah, so Bruce has this. Uh, he likes to listen to an African guy, and he's in a. So you pick your version of the Bible. You pick the voice, and you pick music if you want it. Huh. So I have hymns in the background. Bruce has guitar. Um, anyway, yes. Yeah, so we've actually. I tried it for a couple of months. Thought it was really great. So I got Bruce a got it for bruce and anyway yeah so it's called dwell yeah um and actually matt chandler i mean i i don't know who started it but um it's recommended by matt chandler we uh supported a ministry that um sent it out to all of its you know sent out a link for all of the people that um were involved with that ministry so that's how i found out about it i didn't know about it either ah Wow, people keep going into the waiting room. Here we go. And Chris, I just wanted to tell you, do you prefer that I send it to you that I'd like to uh, be part of the December 10th thing? Um, or do you want me to send you an email? No, that's fine. You, you told me, I, you know, it's, I just, I kind of wanted to know who'd be there, but it's fine if people just show up. <laughs> okay. um, so, I mean, we, there are definitely a number of folks who want to talk about women in the church and that's what we'll do. Great. Next week. And then the week after, we'll have one more session after that and then take a break for Christmas and New Year's. And uh, looks like there's enough interest to keep going for a little bit with Acts after the first of the year. I, I think um, I want to try to wrap it up no later than the end of February. Um, so how is everybody tonight? Hey, Billy. Good morning, Billy. My yeah. Hi, Billy. And what's the temperature in India now? How hot is it? I don't know. It's just 75. Just 75. Okay. <laughs> Probably the same for Dave in Florida. <laughs> yes. Yeah, we're we're below freezing here now, so. And supposed to get six to ten inches of snow on Saturday. Really? We, we are. Oh. We are. Well, you guys. Even At least on Calvin, our hill. So even though Calvin's <laughs> retired, you're still keeping up on the weather? <laughs> oh, yeah. That's his, you know, he's been doing it for 40-some years. So. <laughs> hey, he's a man after my own heart. I always like to know what the weather is going to be. But so six to eight inches this weekend, you say? Six to ten on Saturday. Wow. I had not heard that. I got a weather it, it, alert this it, afternoon. It really just phone. popped up. It was supposed to be rainy all day Saturday, but the storm is developing. Uh, I'm not really sure what it's going to do. So that's the initial forecast. So. Okay. Okay. Well, wow. Plenty, plenty of room down here, guys. <laughs> <laughs> I'm dreaming of a white Christmas. There you go. So Antonio, where's Corinna tonight? Oh, she had a, a procedure with the doctor, so she doesn't feel 100%. Oh. She's fine. She's not sick or anything. Okay, okay, good. Out of her uh, physical. Okay. Well, some of you may know, um, I think this is fine for me to share, but Sandra, uh, Sandra, who's usually with us, um, she and her husband have COVID. So they did test positive. 
Yeah, they, he did test positive. I've been emailing with them. Um, they're not too sick at this point, um, and they are at home. Um, so I, I was not expecting to see them tonight, but keep them in your prayers. Yeah. Let's see, how's our time? Okay. So I want to uh, do chapters six, seven, and eight tonight. And if you That's believe, impressive. believe that, <laughs> <laughs> I have a bridge in Brooklyn I want to sell you. <laughs> But you know, who knows? Who knows? It could happen. Huh. Okay. Um, so, uh, Antonio, can I ask you to pray for us and we'll dive in? Um, Holy Father, we uh, give you thanks for, uh, for this time where we can gather in the name of our Lord Jesus, to, to learn from your word. Father, uh, for those that couldn't be here tonight, uh, that you will uh, bless them. And if those that are sick, that you will uh, bring your healing upon them. Mm -hmm. Father, pray that uh, you will uh, fill uh, Chris with your Holy Spirit, Father, that uh, he will have the wisdom and the words to transmit to, to us, Father, and that your word will be planted in our hearts and that be, it will be fruitful. Uh, we pray in the name of our Lord, our Messiah, Jesus. Amen. 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 Thank you. All right, let me get the PowerPoint. There we go. Uh, okay. okay. Is everybody seeing it? Yes. Yep. Okay, great. Let's turn my grid so I can see all of you. Okay. All right. There we go. Okay. So we are on episode 12. And. Uh, <laughs> I've titled it Going with Stephen and Philip. So here we go. Um, so like I say, we're going to try to, to cover the uh, second half of chapter six and through eight. We're not going to do a total verse by verse analysis, but um, hit, hit quite a few landmarks. Um, so tell me again, the four key components of a healthy church. Ministry. Mission. Mission. Evangelism. Worship. Yeah. What's the community. 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 There's one more. Evangelism. Leadership. Leadership. There you go. Evangelism is part of mission. Right. Um, you're using mission in the broadest sense of the word. Um, good. So, um, so look at, uh, just remind us of Jesus's, you know, the Great Commission, where he says, go, go therefore and make disciples of all nations. Um, you know, in these chapters that we're looking at tonight, the, 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 the disciples are beginning to go, right? They're beginning to push out beyond Jerusalem, and they're kind of getting toward reaching out to non-Jews as well, um, so, you know, we, we've seen that this is what Jesus wants his people to do. He essentially reiterates the Great Commission in, in Acts 1.8. Um, and so we've reflected on having a go mentality uh, rather than a come mentality in the church. Um, we've talked about how the Holy Spirit enables Christians and churches to go. Uh, these are just slides you've seen before. And that we want to foster a go uh, culture. Uh, in the life of the church, because um, we are people who should go, go therefore. So tonight we're going to look at Stephen and Philip. Um, so who are these guys? Who are Stephen and Philip? Well, they're not apostles. They're more like uh, deacons. They're, they've been appointed to serve probably widows and the poor. Right. Two of the seven. 
Yeah, exactly. They are part they are of the seven who are appointed in the first half of chapter six to distribute food. Um, and so, you know, we might call them deacons. Um, but these guys are zealous for the Lord, and they both move out, move out from Jerusalem and are seeking to bring the gospel um, to other people. Um, and so they're sort of precursors of what's going to happen with Peter and with Paul um, as the gospel really breaks out beyond Jewish confines. Um, so, you know, we're, but it's interesting. We're not told a whole lot about them, are we? Um, oh, here comes Jim. Um, we don't know a great deal about these guys. Um, they, uh, we just know that they are men full of the spirit full of wisdom, with good reputation, right? Um, and we don't really hear much more about them uh, after these chapters. Um, Philip is mentioned a, a little later on in Acts uh, 21 here. You see Paul talks about, on the next day we left and came to Caesarea. That's Caesarea um, Maritima. Um, and entering the house of Philip the Evangelist, who is one of the seven, so that's referring back to Acts 6. Uh, we stayed with him. Now this man had four virgin daughters who were prophetesses. So that's the only other mention of Philip outside of chapter 8 um, that we have. And, and it's interesting, you know, so he's, we're going to see him traveling around a little bit, and he settles apparently in Caesarea. And he's a good family man, I guess, and raising up his kids in the way of the Lord. Huh? <laughs> he's got four daughters who are, who are prophetesses. Um, that's kind of exciting. Um, so, you know, I want us to be encouraged that, you know, these are men who are full of the spirit, full of wisdom, with good reputation, but they're just average Christians, right? They're, they're really average Christians. Um, it's the Holy Spirit who is empowering them and making them able um, to do this great work. Um, and we see them moving around and preaching and doing signs and wonders, right? They're doing deliverance. They're doing healing. Um, and I just want to give you a church principle right here at this point, that signs and wonders, service and evangelism, were not just for the apostles, but for all. Uh, and they continue to be so today, I would maintain. Um, so, but we see this. So here are two guys who are not apostles, going out and preaching the word with signs and wonders. So it wasn't just the apostles who were uh, doing power ministry or performing miracles. Um, so let me ask you this. Are Stephen and Philip Lone Rangers? Now, I, I've said before in this series that there are no Lone Rangers, or shouldn't be, <laughs> in the kingdom. And that in Acts, we don't see... Uh, guys doing ministry on their own. They're always out there with teams. Stephen and Philip don't seem to have a team with them. But what do you think? Are, are they Lone Rangers? Um, I would say, am I on? Can yeah, I, I can hear oh, you. Oh, sorry. Um, I would say no. <laughs> <laughs> they're not lone rangers i mean just because they're alone um yeah. i don't think means that they're lone rangers because i think when these folks were being sent out that there was a they all knew what they were doing there was a an understanding of the purpose of what they were doing so they knew this person was going to be over here this one's going to be way over here mm -hmm. and they had a job and a mission to do so these two might have been physically alone or not teamed up, but they weren't alone in their mission. Okay. That's good. Just a... Yeah. Did somebody else have a comment? Yeah. So they, uh, you know, actually we're going to see that Stephen, he doesn't really go very far, does he? <laughs> he's, he's really just in the Jerusalem environs. Uh, we're not sure kind of how far out he gets. Um, and he's brought before the Sanhedrin. So really, we can think of him as being a part of the church there in Jerusalem, the mother church. And, uh, you know, as Marianne's saying, he's not really out there on his own. He may be not, he's not partnered with someone, but he's part of the church community there. 
Well, would they have relied solely on his telling of the story that's in the book of Acts uh, that tells what he did, or would there be witnesses there to it? Yeah, that that's interesting. Uh, you know, how, how do they know exactly what Stephen said before the Sanhedrin? I'm, well, I'm going to say there, and uh, the other evangelical, evangelistic things that the single uh, singular people did uh, there had to be someone else there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. So I, we can speculate that there was somebody else there, or um, there were guys uh, in the Sanhedrin who um, became Christians, you know, and and you know reported how Stephen carried himself, what he said, and how he died. Um, so yeah, he, he probably wasn't out there in a Lone Ranger fashion. Oh, and by the way, maybe for Billy's benefit, I don't know if you're familiar with the Lone Ranger. <laughs> it's, it's a character from the, what, 40s, 50s, maybe even 30s, right? He started on radio. You know, he was a cowboy <laughs> in the American West who, and he actually wasn't alone either because he had his faithful sidekick, Tonto, right? Um, and his- And hi-ho silver. And then his horse silver, that's right. <laughs> but you understand what I'm after here. <laughs> And, you know, and Philip, uh, it's interesting, we, we're going to see him go to Samaria and really have a very fruitful ministry there. Um, but the apostles come, right, to check, to check his work, as it were, you know, so he's, he's still connected um, with the mother church. He's not just kind of out there doing his own thing. Um, he's connected with the apostolic leadership uh, back uh, in Jerusalem. Um, and it, it's fun to... Uh, to consider so no lone rangers still no lone rangers um so how about uh, somebody read this for us acts 6 verses 8 uh, through 11 um, susan how about you read that for us and stephen full of grace and power was performing great wonders and signs among the people but some men from what was called the synagogue of the freedmen, freedmen including both Cyrenians and Alexandrians, and some from Cilicia and Asia rose up and argued with Stephen. But they were unable to cope with the wisdom and the spirit with which he was speaking. When they secretly induced men to, then they secretly induced men to say, we have heard him speak blasphemous words against Moses and against God. All right, a couple questions off this passage. Um, I, actually, let me ask you to go ahead and keep reading through verse 15. And they stirred up the people, the elders and the scribes, and they came up to him and dragged him away and brought him before the council, the Sanhedrin. They put forward false witnesses who said, this man incessantly speaks against this holy place and the law, for we have heard him say that this Nazarene Jesus will destroy this place and alter the customs which Moses handed down to us. And fixing their gaze on him, all who were sitting in the council saw his face like the face of an angel. So what was the nature of Stephen's witness? How is his witnessing described? Hmm. Well, it does sound like he's, he was repeating things that Jesus had said. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think uh, we can also be pretty certain he's making connections between the Old Testament, between the Hebrew scriptures, and Jesus is fulfilling those. Um, but how did he carry himself? How, how, does, how does he describe his coming across? Verses 8 and 10 in particular. Full of faith and power, number one. Faith and power, yep. Okay. So, I mean, first thing he says, he's full of grace, right? Full of grace. Um, so, he's bringing a message of grace to people, a message of grace. And We'll see more about this in a second. Um, he's full of power. So full of grace, full of power. So he's operating in signs and wonders. And uh, spirit he's spirit-filled, right? And, and speaking how? With wisdom. With wisdom. Yeah. So he's speaking with wisdom and the spirit. And they're kind of amazed at this guy. Um, and his, his face, his face is glowing. <laughs> yes. So he's, he's performing signs and wonders. Um, he's bringing a message of grace 
to the people, not a message of works and law, um, but a message of grace. And he's speaking through the power of the spirit and with great uh, wisdom. So how, how did Stephen enemies respond? They didn't really listen to him because they went off and made up their own version of what he was saying. Right, yeah. So even though I've got the picture of him being stoned, we haven't really got to that yet. But in chapter six, we see they, they have to make things up, right? They make things up uh, and, and twist uh, what he's saying um, and take his, his statements out of context to get him in trouble uh, with the Jewish authorities, right? So they bring forth false witnesses false witnesses. They, they couldn't cope. They couldn't, they couldn't uh, shut him up in a fair argument, right? In, in, a, in a, you know, good back and forth. Um, they were, they were kind of amazed at his wisdom um, and amazed at the signs and wonders he's performing. So they have to invent things and twist things um, to get him into trouble. So I, I want to digress here for a moment. Um, because it, I think this actually points to an important concept for us as Christians. Um, I, I was having a discussion recently with some pastors, uh, and we were talking about the ruined reputation of evangelicals in the United States, um, that, that the church has a bad reputation now because so many evangelicals have allied themselves with Trumpism and had bought into conspiracy theories and whatnot. And, you know, it's funny after I was having this conversation, mm -hmm. not funny, haha, -ha, funny, ironic, um, with these pastors, the, the very next day, my wife Susan, in walking the dog, ran into a, a friend who also walks her dog. And this friend, unprompted, <laughs> asked Susan about what is going on with evangelicals. Um, she's a devout Catholic. But she says she's always admired evangelicals. Um, and she's shocked to see what, what evangelical Christians are saying and, you know, and, and what they're saying about um, Biden and people they oppose and you know, just horrible things. And you know, they've tied themselves to, to Trump. Um, and she says she's just, she's just stunned, stunned. And she said, literally, I have always admired evangelicals for their zeal and their love of the Lord. Um, I'm really changing my mind on that. So, you know, by allying themselves with Trump and his policies, evangelicals are now seen as supporting someone and supporting agendas that are at the expense of others, uh, that's cruel and corrupt, that uh, is full of lies and falsehoods and deception. So one pastor said, well, Christians will always be criticized. It, it's it, if it's not one thing, it's another, right? So he wasn't terribly concerned that evangelicals have this bad reputation. He says, oh, you know, they'll just come up with something else to slander us about. So what do you think of that statement? This is, this is, this whole thing with the evangelicals, I shouldn't even get going because it ticks me off, but anyway. <laughs> It's more than just something that they criticize the evangelicals about. I think we've been, I think a lot of evangelicals have just, they just vote Republican. They don't really think about it because that's the way most evangelicals have always voted. And I think we need to think more than a lot of people are. We have to think through the whole thing. We have to look at the person, not just vote the party. Right. Yeah, there's an interesting text in Romans 2.24. Uh, I don't have a slide for it, sorry. It says, for the name of God, Paul's actually quoting from the Old Testament, for the name of God is blasphemed among the Gentiles because of you. <laughs> because of you. Now, God's name is being blasphemed. I mean, if you look on social media at all, I mean, Susan was looking at something last night and uh, uh, responding, people responding to Beth Moore, who I think has had a very good, clear-eyed 
uh, view of things. Um, but they were saying, I, you know, I just, I'm sort of done with the church. I'm done with the church. You know, the, the behavior over the past four years or so is just so reprehensible. Um, and, and here's the, here's the issue. Um, Peter, in his first letter, he says, keep your behavior excellent among the Gentiles so that in the thing in which they slander you as evildoers, they may on account of your good deeds as they observe them glorify God in the day of visitation. And I think this is even clearer in the next chapter of 1 Peter 3. Who is there to harm you if you prove zealous for what is good? Now the problem is, is that people are looking at us and saying, you seem zealous for bad things. Mm -hmm. But even if you should suffer for the sake of righteousness, you're blessed and do not fear their intimidation, do not be troubled. Sanctify Christ as Lord in your heart. This is the great apologetics verse, always being ready to make a defense to everyone who asks you to give an account for the hope that is in you, yet with gentleness and reverence. A lot of Christians haven't been gentle and reverent lately. And keep a good conscience so that in the thing in which you are slandered, the thing in which you are slandered, those who revile your good behavior in Christ will be put to shame. For it is better if God should will it so that you suffer for doing what is right rather than for doing what is wrong. So the issue is to say, oh, well, well there, unbelievers are always going to criticize us about stuff. Sure, I suppose that's true. But we want them to have to make up stuff to criticize us about, not be able to so easily pin us with bad behavior, right? We want to be in Stephen's position where they have to make it up um, if they're going to say something bad uh, about us. So here's the church principle out of this. Seek to live, both as individuals and as churches, in such a way that enemies will have to make stuff up to slander you. And uh, unfortunately, right now, I, I think the, the church at large is in a place where they don't have to make stuff up. They've got plenty of ammunition um, to write us off. We've and, been handing it to them. Yeah, we've been handing it to them. Really because we, well, I, I don't want to go down this <laughs> too far, but I felt like it was important to make this point, you know, that as we see Stephen having false witnesses brought against him, that's not, that's often not what's happening to us right now. It's not false witnesses brought against us. It's very legitimate um, pointing of the finger and saying, what are you doing? What are you saying? You call yourselves Christians. Well, I think there's a fundamental difference and this kind of just popped into my head, so it's not exactly well thought out, but talk about, we're talking about Stephen being in the spirit. And obviously they're talking about the spirit of God here. I think a lot of Christians are operating in a spirit these days that is not the spirit of God. <laughs> yeah. And, and that, that, you know, when, I mean, what was Stephen, it, it, it said, oh, and they were not able to resist the wisdom and the spirit by which he spoke. Amen. That's not that's not just being amazed. That's just being totally captivated. And you know, and and, and what, what's happening is that people are getting that way about the spirit of the age, which is the spirit of all of the stuff that's going on with Trump and the racism and everything else. Right. That's the spirit that everybody's operating in. They're yeah. not operate. They're in a spirit of self righteousness because, oh, this, all this stuff is wrong. Instead of you know, because there's a fundamental difference between that and the spirit of God. Right. People yeah, are not going to get amazed and not be able to resist when you're operating in in a worldly spirit. Right. I think that's people in general, as opposed to specifically in evangelicals. True, but evangelicals should know better. <laughs> uh, agreed. <laughs> we, agreed. Should, we should be, uh, you know, being transformed in Christ, right? Um, but yeah, we, we find ourselves pursuing the very same things that unbelievers are pursuing. And, and 
you know, many unbelievers wouldn't pursue. Any, many unbelievers are uh, appalled at, and yet yeah. Christians are pursuing these things. Chris, um, if I might add, just because, as you know, I, I grew up in like a hyper conservative legalistic family mm. and just speaking with a bunch of my relatives. So pursuing, pursuing this, they kind of view it like, uh, you know, he mentioned self-righteousness. Um, a lot of them truly think uh, pursuing some of the avenues that we that you just recently mentioned um, is a form of righteousness and that if they don't support certain parties or uh supporting certain parties are basically Platform. following yeah following their christian following their their you know their their christian duty in any you know in supporting the uh, trump and other things that he stands for um any person you know any any slander that they get is just righteous persecution mm -hmm. um so I think there's definitely a kind of a mental roadblock there. Um, so, but yeah, it's. Yeah, it's I think, you know, I think this was happening even in the first century. When, you know, this is why Peter says, you know, for uh, that you suffer for doing what is right rather than for doing what is wrong. Right. And it is unfortunate that Christians sometimes can't see that what they're doing is wrong. Um, I, I think it's interesting to note that when Jesus chose his disciples, he chose a tax collector, cleanly, clearly aligned with government and the state, and he chose a zealot, cleanly, <laughs> clearly aligned in total opposition to the state and government. Right. And, but he, he didn't just let them live in the condition that they were in while he was with them. He didn't let their teaching affect what he was teaching, he pulled them out of there because the first call of Christ is for us to be changed ourselves, to be made new, and to not be swayed by the, the uh, arguments of the day, whether for or against a particular thing, and yet pursue Christ's justice for things. So all right. I'm, I'm talking too much now, but there you go. Yeah, yeah, I, I absolutely agree. I, yeah, and I we could easily go down this rabbit hole and you know talk about why things are the way they are, oh. but, um, which is a worthwhile conversation to have, but not here. <laughs> and I, I knew I was in danger of opening up a can of worms here, but um, this is one of the reasons that in, in 2021, I want to facilitate a monthly conversation on Christians and social issues. Um, it's, it's precisely for trying to help us to think more biblically about these issues, the kinds of issues that have you know, really come to the surface in the last four years. All right, can I move on? Um, mm -hmm. thank, you for, thank you for letting me get on that soapbox. Um, so I, we're not going to read through Stephen's speech. It's quite lengthy. Um, <laughs> quite remarkable in, in a number of ways, but what strikes you? I hope you read it ahead of time. Uh, what did you find remarkable about Stephen's speech? And there's, there's three things that I wanted to highlight. The historicity of his narrative? Yeah, <laughs> yeah exactly. Um, I put it simply as he really knows his stuff, doesn't he? <laughs> um, his command of the scriptures is uh, quite impressive as he works through particularly Genesis and Exodus. Um, now, we could, there's a lot that could be said here about evangelizing the biblically literate. You know, he's clearly speaking to people who know the scriptures. Um, and we need to be sensitive to who is it that we're talking to? Do they have any kind of biblical understanding or, or are they clueless? Um, but you know, from verses 13 and 14 of, of chapter 6, you know, we get the idea that Stephen had been discussing Jesus's fulfillment of the Old Testament because they accuse him about wanting to turn over the law and uh, to disgrace the temple or destroy the temple, right? So he must have been talking about um, the, we don't need sacrifices anymore. We can worship God anywhere. There's not special places, you know, for God. Um, so, you know, he, his command of the Old Testament and speaking it into the lives of people who were steeped in that 
Um, he was a good apologist in, in this regard. Um, so it, it's important for us to be prepared as best we can ahead of time. And you can never prepare for anything, but I am a strong advocate of Christians never stop learning, right? We never stop learning. We should always be reading. We should always be taking in uh, messages and lectures and whatnot. Um, there's always more to learn about the Lord and about the world, right? Um, so, but as best we can, particularly if we know we're going to a particular people group, you know, we want to prepare to be able to uh, talk uh, well to them. So we need to have a good understanding of our own faith, that we can articulate it clearly to the audience uh, and know something of the audience we're speaking to. Um, what's the second thing that strikes you about this, about his speech? I mean, it'd be hard to, you, 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 there's so much there. Um, I'm really looking for kind of a general overall. Um, take a look at uh, verses 51 through 56. In fact, um, this is chapter seven now, chapter seven, verses 51 through 56. Sarah, could you read those for us? Mm -hmm. You men who are stiff-necked and uncircumcised in heart and ears are always resisting the Holy Spirit. You are doing just as your fathers did. Which one of the prophets did your fathers not persecute? They killed those who had previously announced the coming of the righteous one, whose betrayers and murderers you have now become. You who received the law as ordained by angels and yet did not keep it. So it's accusatory. <laughs> <laughs> yep, it sure is. Um, and so what I'm saying is he boldly shares the bad news and the good news. Right, we've talked about this before. He shares the whole gospel. He's telling these guys they're in trouble. And you, you could read that and say, oh boy, he, is he just being kind of nasty? Um, this doesn't seem very winsome or persuasive approach. Um, but uh, you know what happens when we read the rest of the chapter? Um, Sarah, how about you just read on and finish the chapter for us? 54 through 60? Yeah. Now when they heard this, they were cut to the quick, and they began gnashing their teeth at him. But being full of the Holy Spirit, he gazed intently into heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing at the right hand of God. And he said, Behold, I see the heavens opened up and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. But they cried out with a loud voice and covered their ears and rushed at him with one impulse. When they had driven him out of the city, they began stoning him, and the witness, witnesses laid aside their robes at the feet of a young man named Saul. They went on stoning Stephen as he called on the Lord and said, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. Then falling on his knees, he cried out with a loud voice, Lord, do not hold this sin against them. Having said this, he fell asleep. Uh, did you catch that? What's the last thing Stephen says? Oh, well, yes. Yeah. He, so forgive the, them for they know not what they do. Right. So, you know, Stephen is, even when he's blasting them with the bad news, and I mean, he brings it right to their doorstep. It's not just sort of a general, we're all sinners. It's like, you killed the righteous one. You killed God and Messiah. You were in on that. You supported that. Um, and it, now you're rejecting, you know, his messengers. You're just like your, your forefathers and re who rejected uh, the prophets. Um, but he, even as he's accusing them and, and nailing them for their sin, he's talking about the righteous one, right? He, he's identifying the righteous one as Jesus, the one that they had helped put to death. Um, he's, he's not blaspheming God as he's been accused. He, he's glorifying God. And so he gives them bad news and good news. And particularly there at the end, we see that he is merciful. He's a gracious guy. His, his desire isn't for them to go to hell. His desire is for them to repent. I think it's the same kind of approach that we see when Jesus goes toe to toe uh, with the Pharisees. Um, the, the, what is it, Matthew um, is it 20, 21 with a, the chapter of the woes chapter where he says, woe to you, woe to you, woe to you. It really comes across harsh, but this is how he's trying to get through to these people. 
Jesus does it. Stephen does it. Chris? It, yeah. I, I realize this, I mean, it, this fits under he knows his stuff yeah. uh, in some ways, but I, I just wanted to say, as I read through that, I, I was really struck by um, the fact that, you know, what he's talking about, and I had just been listening to on my my app <laughs> mm -hmm. this genesis to genesis this week and um i i think it, it's it's pretty impressive i mean the, the things he shares remind us that god does not act in ways that we expect mm -hmm. and is he is talking about jesus and the people you know i mean all this all these things about moses i mean things did just not look i mean if you were looking for a political solution or you were looking for a designed solution from how things went with Moses, it wouldn't look like it did. I mean, you know, as he recounts the hardships and the, the way um, things were going on in Egypt and, and, you know, he was put in a basket to die and, and he, you know, was rescued by Pharaoh. I mean, just the reminder that God works in ways that are not of our understanding or design. So I feel like it was so wonderful. I mean, I know that's the good news and the bad news, but I mean, they saw it as, but I just think it, the stories, the things he chose to speak about, if they had been listening, would have reminded them that God works in ways that we do not see. Um, and they would have been able to understand the things Jesus said and what Stephen was saying. Oh, that's good. I, I, I really like that, Susan. I got to write that down. <laughs> um, yeah, that God works in unexpected ways. Um, and they, and they should, and Jesus didn't fit any mold uh, that they were anticipating. And they had the advantage of having known the ends of those stories, right? I mean, because this was previous times. So they knew that God worked through these things. Yeah, yeah. They should have known. They should have known. Very good. Can I ask a question about the third point? Yeah. Um, do you think that request was fulfilled i mean i know god is a just god uh but you know it was kind of a request from stephen do you think at the great white throne judgment that sin will not be held against them <laughs> i don't know i don't know um to, I mean, to my mind, it's interesting that you ask it that way. To my mind, I think about it more in the present tense, you know, that um, don't hold this against them now, you know, continue to give them an opportunity to repent and come to you, Lord. Mm -hmm. um, well, I kind of thought in, on the premise of like, we'll have to give an account of yeah. everything that we've ever done. Right. It's almost like don't, don't, don't credit this to their account request well it, it depends right because we know that saul was there paul mm -hmm. so we know that he didn't count it against paul for example <laughs> right right yeah. Yeah, that's true that's true yeah i mean paul is the most significant uh, uh participant there who who really had his mind changed and you have to think that even though the, the next verse verse one of chapter eight it talks about paul approving of all this and then going out and terrorizing the church, he, I'm sure he kept thinking about Stephen and the way he died and the way he preached the word and the way he handled the scriptures. Um, but yeah, I, you know, who knows? Uh, um, I could see that uh, they, they wouldn't be held to account thanks to Stephen's intercession for that sin, but they'd still have plenty enough sin to condemn them if, unless they come to christ right <laughs> sometimes our human response too is we get worse you know i mean yeah. paul witnessing that watching that can make him even more determined to destroy what's what's out there yeah that's right that's right but you know again so think about stephen it, it, it's this here's this wonderful guy who gives a very good witness um, he served, he preached, he performed miracles, he did apologetics, he challenged, he rebuked, he interceded. I mean, this is a robust, well-rounded evangelistic guy. Um, there, there's, those are extraordinary characteristics, but we know he was spirit-empowered, and we can all aspire to that as well. 
Um, and we know too, and, and just from reading that those last few lines, I mean, you know he was filled by the Spirit, but you also know that in his flesh he knew what was going to happen to him. Yeah. He right. was certainly aware of what was happening to him, and yet he continued. Right. You know, that, I mean, you, you talk about admirable qualities in the guy. He was not afraid of what was going to happen to him. You know, we all talk about not being ashamed of the gospel. Mm. This guy took it to the, <laughs> to the extreme. To the nth degree. <laughs> you know, he, he very literally knew he was probably going to die for the gospel that day. But it didn't stop him. Yeah. Knowing that did not stop him. That's right. I, I, I'm going to I'm going to just highlight that that point in just a moment. Um, I, I just wanted to just reflect again quickly that you know Stephen's accusers they they are false witnesses, but they are working with uh, material that he had put out there. Right? They they don't completely make stuff up. There there seem to be twisting and taking out of context the things that he said. So Stephen had grasped the central truth of the gospel um, and was articulating that, that, you know, we have really been set free. Um, and, uh, you know, he's full of wisdom, he's full of the spirit, and he's undoubtedly, as I said before, connecting the Old Testament, particularly the Mosaic law, the sacrificial system, the, the tabernacle temple, with being fulfilled um, by Jesus. And we're told he's full of grace. So he's, he's saying, you know what? It's grace, grace, all grace. I, you know, I'm, I'm imagining a bit here, but I don't think it's out of the realm of possibility. Um, and his face shines kind of it's reminiscent of Moses' face shining um, when he receives God's revelation, when he's in God's uh, presence. But see, we continue to carry this same message. We carry the same wonderful message. And we sometimes get so wrapped up in other things and do's and don'ts and whatnot. And we, we must remember um, that the whole gospel must be preached, bad news and good news. And that the church brings a message not of religion, but of grace. Right? Not of religion, but of grace. And this is what was threatening the Sanhedrin. You know, this Jesus cult... <laughs> is going to turn over everything we're about, everything we're invested in. Uh, the religion that we have that gives us power over the people, that gives us some kind of confidence that we can be right, make ourselves right with God. And Stephen and, and, and the other apostles and Christian disciples are saying, no, all, all that is <laughs> worthless. We cannot make ourselves right with God. Jesus has done it for us. It's grace, grace, all grace. So we need to preach the whole gospel. We need to get people to understand the bad news so that they can receive the good news. And we need to be sure that we're always bringing a message of grace um, and not of some kind of new religion, as it were. So I, I just, I, I just yeah, want to comment that, uh, that the whole passage started with mentioning that Stephen was, was uh, performing miracles and ends in, with his dad. So, so it, 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 it's someone, you know, who's, you know, healing the blind, maybe. Mm -hmm. And the result is to kill him. Mm -hmm. So I, I just want to mention that contrast that started with performing miracles and with his death. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, let's be let's let's be killed for doing good things, <laughs> for bringing power and blessing into people's lives. So yeah, kind of getting. Amen. Uh, was it you, Dave? Um, oh, I thought I put this text up there. I guess I didn't. Um, I forgot to put it on. It it, it reminds in Philippians one twenty, Paul says, that "With all boldness, Christ shall even now, as always, be exalted in my body, whether by life or by death." Right. That's, that's Stephen. He exalted Christ with his body in life and in his death. Even at the moment of his death, he's exalting Christ. Um, that's a great, great aspiration uh, for us to pursue. Um, 
Yeah, let's keep going. <laughs> um, Billy, could you read for us Acts chapter 8, verses 1 through 8? Yeah. And Saul was consent unto his death. And at the time, there was a great persecution against the church, which was at Jerusalem. And they were all scattered abroad throughout the region of Judea and Samaria, except for the apostles. And devout men carried Stephen to his burial and made great lamentation over him. As for Saul, he made havoc of the church, entering into every house and hail men and women committed them to prison. Therefore, they that were scattered abroad went everywhere preaching the word. Then Philip went down to the city of Samaria and preached Christ unto them. And the people with one accord gave heed unto those things which Philip said, hearing and seeing the miracles which he did. For unclean spirits crying with loud voice came out of many that were possessed with them and many taken with classes and that were laying were healed. And there was great joy in the city. Thank you. So notice verse four, therefore, you know that old adage, whenever you see a therefore in scripture, ask What's it therefore? therefore, therefore. <laughs> so what is it, what is it hooked to? What's the therefore talking about? Next chapter. Yeah, it's the next the next thing that's going to happen. So, what happened before the therefore, and what happens after? Saul happened right before it. Yeah, yeah. The, and a terrible persecution of the yeah. church, right? <clears throat> they were scattered. They scattered. And their response was, "Well, we should do what we were told to do wherever we are, which is preach the word." Right. Right. You know, we wouldn't be surprised if it said, uh, you know, Saul's breathing down their neck. <laughs> their people are being dragged off to prison, put to death. Um, so the church goes into hiding. Right. It didn't say we went into hiding and we and we never heard from the church again. <laughs> the end. <laughs> right. They, don't, they keep <laughs> preaching, right? They, they get driven out of Jerusalem. They keep preaching. The apostles stay put in Jerusalem, but they keep preaching. Um, so, you know, God uses that. We have reflected on this some weeks ago, but that God uses this persecution to help get the church in go mode, to help break it out of Jerusalem uh, and get past uh, being just a Jewish oriented, Jerusalem oriented um, community. And so now we encounter Philip who heads off to Samaria, a little north of Jerusalem. He, again, he's one of the seven deacons. He's a man of good reputation, full of spirit and wisdom. Um, why is it extraordinary that he goes to Samaria? The Samaritans were unclean and enemies of Jerusalem, of Hebrews. <laughs> yeah. That's uh, all Jews. in quotes, by the way. <laughs> the Jews and the Samaritans, they, they hated each other, right? Um, they really didn't like each other. So that's kind of extraordinary that Philip goes to preach the gospel to them. Um, so he, he does. And why were the Samaritans interested in what Philip had to say? What verse was it? It says, uh, the, verse six, the crowds with one accord were giving attention to what was said by Philip. Why? Why were they giving him, why were they giving him their attention? Because of the signs that he was doing? Yeah, because of the signs and wonders, right? There's this power evangelism going on that's getting people's attention. Particularly, we're told he's doing deliverance ministry, he's casting demons out of people, uh, and, and uh, physical healing, physical healing as well. Um, it right, strikes so me that the Samaritans were greatly afflicted people, uh, even more so than... Well, in many ways, more so than the Hebrews, because not only were they also in Roman occupied territory, but the very territory that they were in was occupied by the Hebrews that hated them and laid claim to the territory as their own. 
yeah, there was some tension over who owned uh, that turf. Um, uh, but yeah, so, you know, here comes this Jew who's doing these powerful signs and wonders showing kindness and goodness to them and bringing healing and delivering people. So yeah, they, he's got their attention. He's got their attention. Um, and now, you know, he's going, he's, be, he's beginning to stretch out. This is to people who are not Jews, um, who are culturally different um, from Philip. Um, but nonetheless, he reaches, he reaches out to them. Um, and then we have this interesting episode with Philip, Peter, and Simon the Magician. All right, so uh, Philip preaches the gospel to the Samaritans. There's a revival that happens, right? People are getting saved there. And so um, Peter uh, comes at, with some other apostles to check out what's happening. Right? Um, and they have this encounter with this magician, right? Um, so, uh, Lynn, how about you read for us verses 9 through 13 of chapter 8? Now, there was a certain man named Simon, who formerly was practicing magic in the city and astonishing the people of Samaria, claiming to be someone great. And they all, from the smallest to the greatest, were giving attention to him, saying, this man is what is called the great power of God. And they were giving him attention because he had for a long time astonished them with his magic arts. But when they believed Philip preaching the good news about the kingdom of God in the name of Jesus Christ, they were baptized, men and women alike. And even Simon himself believed. And after being baptized, he continued on with Philip as he observed the signs and great miracles taking place. He was constantly amazed. So we, we, we got uh, Philip, you know, proclaiming, performing signs and wonders. Simon, this magician, I'm sure he looked just like this. Um, <laughs> he's, uh, he's intrigued. He gets baptized. So there's a real question. Is Simon really saved? Um, we don't know. There's church tradition that says he's not. He's identified in church tradition with Simon Magnus, who is considered kind of a father of Gnosticism, um, but that's all very speculative. We're not really sure, but there's some interesting dynamics and some interesting principles we need to pull out of this, which we're not going to get to tonight. Um, but but here's what I want you to, let me, I'm just trying to figure out how to wrap it up for this evening, and we'll, we'll continue this in two weeks. Um, so I want you to be aware that signs and wonders are important but they are not the primary focus, right? That's not the primary focus. It's the gospel. It's the preaching of the word. And when Simon gets saved, there's a, there's a danger of kind of a pop star mentality happening here, right? This is what we often see happen. If somebody famous gets saved, we immediately put them into positions of responsibility or, you know, high profile. Um, because we're so excited that this famous person got saved. Um, this is something of the danger here uh, for Simon. Um, there needs to be humility on the part of new converts uh, and a desire to be taught uh, and to grow in Christ. Um, but I wanted you to notice Philip's message. Um, in verse 5, it talks about that he's proclaiming Christ to the Samaritans, right? So he's introducing Jesus to them. And then in verse 12, it talks about he, he's, he's telling them the good news of the kingdom, the good news of the kingdom. And these signs and wonders, as we've said before, is the kingdom breaking in, that not yet coming into the now. Um, and then also in verse 12, the, the name of Jesus, right? It's the name of Jesus that they're re responding to. Um, they're being baptized in his name. So Jesus they're hearing about Jesus. They're hearing about the, the coming of the kingdom. They're seeing the coming of the kingdom. And uh, Philip is saying, Jesus is the king of this kingdom. <laughs> uh, believe in him. And so th this leads to their breaking with their past. And they, they are baptized, which is that you know, clear symbol of breaking with the past. So let me, let me give you two other church principles here, and we'll call it a night. Um, oh, wait a minute. Okay, uh, yeah, let's do this. 
What, what does all this tell us about the Samaritans? That's a cool photo, by the way. Yeah, that, that's apparently a, a photo of Samaritans. Not, not from back then, but <laughs> uh, I think in the early 1900s. What does this tell us about the Samaritans? That they were open to they were, they were open to what? Anything. <laughs> <laughs> well, here's what I'm getting at. It's interesting because if you look at it, the same kind of language is used in their reaction to Simon and their reaction to Philip, except for the language of believe, right? They're amazed by Simon and his wonder working. They're amazed by Philip and his wonder working, but they believe in Jesus. Mm. It's a difference. So they're spiritually hungry people. They're a spiritually yeah. hungry people, right? Um, you know, I remember back in the 80s when the New Age movement was really exploding. And uh, in Northampton here, we were having uh, New Age fairs and conferences and whatnot. And uh, there was lots of material Christians were putting out there. How do we combat the New Age? How do we respond to this? You know, which was good, which was appropriate. But what it was often neglected was in a way, it, it, even though the New Age was dangerous and false and leading people into dangerous territory, on the other hand, it showed that people were spiritually hungry. They wanted to know that there was something more to life than just what they encountered with their five senses. Um, they just were looking in the wrong places. Right? So we need to have that kind of sensitivity um, when we see what people are up to, we need to say, well, what is it they're hungry for? What is it they are thirsty for? Um, whatever it is, the gospel has the answer they're looking for. <laughs> and we need to uh, articulate that and demonstrate that to them. And so here comes Philip to a people who've been marveling at Simon the Magician's uh, works of power. And he comes in and says, you want to see works of power? <laughs> you know, look what Jesus can do. Uh, and draws them to uh, the truth. So the principle here is that we should recognize a people's hunger and minister to that hunger. Now, this isn't saying any, everything about how we minister, because sometimes we need to minister things that they, they're not even thinking about, that they're not aware of. But this is a good entry point. Um, it's the same thing that Paul does in Mars Hill on Acts 17. I see you have an altar to an unknown God. <laughs> Let me tell you who that is. He sees their hunger and he speaks to it. And he speaks to them about things they, they don't know about. So this is a good church principle to recognize a, a, a person or a people group's hunger and minister to that hunger. Think about how does the gospel apply here? And then signs and wonders should never be separated from the content of the message, the Amen. content of the gospel, right? Signs and wonders are extremely helpful and valuable, um, but they don't replace explaining who Jesus is and what he's done for us. Right? We don't want people, which seems to be something of what's happening with Simon, is he's kind of more wedded to the signs and wonders than he actually is to Jesus. So signs and wonders are, are simply uh, tools there to demonstrate the inbreaking of the kingdom, that Jesus truly lives, that he reigns and rules. Um, and that's to get people to Jesus, to get people um, to the gospel. I, I'm going to stop there. There's more, some more I want to say about uh, what happens uh, with Philip uh, in Samaria and also uh, what happens with him and the uh, Ethiopian. We will take a quick look at that. So we'll wrap up Philip uh, next in two weeks because um, next week we're going to have a special session, right? Um, are any other questions or comments before we close? I was just going to say in, in light of what you were just talking about, can we go back? if you go back into the gospel, so many times Jesus, he would do a miracle for somebody, he would heal somebody, and then he would say, don't tell anybody that I did this for you. <laughs> and and one, of the one of the reasons why, in my view, that he said that 
was that he didn't want people to get caught up in the miracle as opposed to the message. Right. Yep. Uh, so that's Jesus living out this very principle that you're talking about right now. Yeah, I, I think that's absolutely right, Dave. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> one, one other thing was um, in, in, in John chapter four, we see Jesus kind of softened up the Sumerians when he visited there and ministered mm -hmm. to them. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, I think they were, they were familiar with the message and that helped Philip in, in communicating to them what he did. So that's kind of an interesting um, side yeah, there. Yeah, it's very likely. I mean, it's quite a, kind of remarkable in John 4, we see that a real revival <laughs> breaks out in Samaria, that lots of people respond to Jesus kind of in a, a more robust way than, than his fellow Jews were responding to him. Uh, yeah. So yeah, there there was perhaps uh, you know Philip said, "Remember that guy who visited you a little while back? <laughs> Boy, can I have I got news for you?" <laughs> yeah, very good. Any I other? think one of the, oh. one of the things that I was uh, not that I was really not, not that I haven't read it before, but I think just uh, having it impressed on me even more is when uh, after Stephen was killed murdered uh and paul was there i mean yeah paul was there and then he starts just this rampage of trying to mm. clear everybody out and really destroy this whole cult faith and people were scattered the fact that they they scattered and preached to me is just so remarkable they were so filled mm. with the spirit and their belief in in Christ that they just went and did, I would have, I just feel like I would have run and hid, you know, until it yeah. calmed down and maybe I'd come out and say a few things. Right. But I mean, their, their courage uh, is just remarkable to me. Yeah, it really, it really is. Uh, I, thank you for underscoring that. Well, let me close this with a word of prayer. Lord, uh, there's so much to learn from uh, just these, this small window into Stephen's life and into Philip's life. Um, we would want to aspire to be a men and women like them. Um, Lord, we know that we can only do it through the power of your Holy Spirit. But we want to be people who go, uh, even in the midst of a pandemic, we want to think creatively about how we can reach non-Christians. Lord, we want to be people who clearly articulate the gospel, who know our stuff, who know the culture that we're speaking into. And we ask that you would help us with these things, Lord, because our ultimate goal is to see you glorified and to see as many people drawn to you and saved as is possible. We want to see your kingdom coming on earth as it already is in heaven. And uh, we are awed and privilege to be a part of that kingdom coming. So let us be go people like Stephen and Philip, Lord. We ask it in your name. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Chris. Thank you guys again. You're such a delight. Bye, guys. Thank you. And I'm going to send a, an, a link out to an art, article that I found quite helpful in, in um, sorting out uh, as Christians this political um, division within our within the body of Christ and uh, part of what Sarah said um, it will be represented there and and just it uh, it doesn't sort it all out I mean but it really was helpful to me to understand how we ended up sitting next to people in pews who look at life so differently it gives mm -hmm. them it, it was very helpful. So I'm gonna. If you get an art something from me from Christianity Today, that's what it is. I was gonna say that. I'm just gonna say it's the Christianity Today one. So. Oh, okay. I, there's I'm, all, I'm uh, there's also a book called Jesus and John Wayne. Have you read that, Chris? Uh, I I've seen it. I have not read it. I'm reading it. I, it, I. It's not a hard read. It's just my time is not. I have not spent the time I should have, but my cousin recommended it, and it's it's pretty amazing. Hmm. Just going back in history, how evangelicals got uh, 
Where they yeah. are today. Yeah. Where they are today, right. <laughs> yeah, this is why I, lately I've been identifying myself as just an old Jesus freak. Uh, yeah, right? <laughs> <laughs> you know, that things kind of took an interesting turn once we moved into the 80s. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. Oh, they did. Yeah. I just wanted to tell you, when you first were praying about that we are odd, all I heard was ODD. Not <laughs> Well, that too. <laughs> ODD, yeah. Okay. <laughs> we're, odd, we're odd and we're odd. <laughs> yeah. Uh, well, okay. Well, anyway, just wanted to forewarn you that I was going to send that out to everybody. Good. And Thank you. Thank you. I look forward to seeing that. So, you know, next week we'll do a special uh, session on women in the church. And, you know, you can take part in that if you want to or not. If you have any particular questions, please send them to me quick. So I can be somewhat prepared. <laughs> um, Sarah, Sarah's already sent a good, good bunch. Um, I, I'm not going to promise we're going to solve the whole thing, but uh, Chris, uh, we uh, expect more from you. <laughs> You're supposed to fix the church. Yeah, let's go. <laughs> yeah, I would be hard pressed to come up with a question more clever than Sarah's. Right. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, Chris, how many did Robert and I send? It was. Nine, eight, ten. I think. Yeah, eight. Eight, or, eight or nine, yeah. Yeah. So, yep. yeah, it was good. Rob and I had fun sitting down and, and picking out what we thought, you know, would be the most stymieing. <laughs> <laughs> well, they were, uh, for the most part, they were pretty classic <laughs> questions. So, yeah, it's good. I, I appreciate that. All right, so I'll see, see you all next week, and, uh, and then we'll finish up Philip and uh, hopefully get into Peter uh, and Paul a little bit a week after. All, All right, right buddy. God bless you and good night. Have a good night. Good night. Good night.